The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. King Herod heard of the disciples preaching for Jesus' name. Name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason, these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests, and the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? She replied, The head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for his guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. In a court of law, when someone is going to give a sworn testimony, they are asked to take an oath responding to the question, Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? And once having affirmed that they will tell the truth, if anything they say under oath that is found to be not true, they are li liable to be charged with perjury. Generally, generally speaking, there are no such penalties for those who fail to tell the truth when not under oath. We hope people will tell the truth because it's the right thing to do, because they are honest and truthful people, whereas it's needed to tell the truth in some situations, courageous people. Why? Because telling the truth can be risky business. People don't always want to hear the truth, especially when it exposes or calls into question what we are doing, or when facing it is painful or inconvenient, or when it means we can no longer perpetuate untruths we have used to justify what we have been doing or what we have been saying. In our biblical readings for today, we encounter two prophets whose truth-telling was met with such resistance Amos and John, who were both speaking truth to power. Amos was told to leave town and take his act elsewhere. John, well, we know what happened to John. Amos was challenging an unjust situation in a time of relative peace and prosperity in Israel. He was pointing out the injustice of those who acquired tremendous wealth and power at the expense of those from whom money and power were constantly being taken away. Amos shown the light on a situation either ignored or justified or even perpetuated by the religious and political powers that be. He was telling it like it is. And that's what prophets do, what they did as well. A prophet in the Old Testament tradition is not a fortune teller who can see into the future as much as a truth teller who can see and speak clearly about what is going on in the present. Think Rosa Parks rather than a fortune teller at the circus. The prophets in our midst challenge us to face up to what is happening rather than ignore or perpetuate it. They call us out. And so often we really don't want to have to acknowledge such truth or make the kinds of changes it may demand of us. And so it turns out Jack Nicholson was right. People can't handle the truth. It was true of those to whom Amos spoke his words of challenge, Amaziah, the state priest, who himself benefited greatly from the inequalities that existed, 
spoke in defense of the King Jeroboam, who presided over an increasingly disproportionate kingdom. Go back to where you come from, Amaziah said, and prophesy there, but never again prophesy here. Why? For this is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Not the kingdom of God, mind you, but only the kingdom over which Jeroboam ruled. Let's get one thing clear, Amaziah was saying. I serve at the king's pleasure, and I am loyal to the king, and I will not tolerate anyone who tries to undermine what the king is doing. His loyalties were with the king who guaranteed his own prosperity, whose power guaranteed his own. And so he told Amos, don't come in here with your truth-telling and mess up this good thing we've got going. Sound at all familiar? John the baptizer experienced some of that same attitude himself when he was critical of Herod's marriage, a marriage that everyone knew was not only immoral, but also illegal under Jewish law. Only no one dared say anything about it. No one except John, of course. And what happened when he chose to call it like it is? Herod's wife, Herodias, was determined to not let John mess up the good things she had going by his truth-telling, and so she enlisted the help of her daughter, charmed Herod into publicly granting her one wish, which, of course, she could have chosen anything, but so great was her resentment of John's criticism, she asked to have his head on a platter. And his pride and reputation at stake, Herod felt obligated to give her what she asked for, a gruesome example of the lengths to which we will go to defend what we are doing, even if it is not good or right or true. People can't handle the truth sometimes, or at least don't want to. So often we prefer more convenient versions of reality, versions that seem to be more beneficial to us. Think about our collective resistance, not only to accepting, but also to seriously addressing climate change. At this point, the scientific community has given us plenty of information about the cumulative effects of human activity on the planet. We're not just projecting those effects into the future, but are seeing them now taking place in the present. But like with the coronavirus, there are still those who refuse to acknowledge its existence. Is it because there is credible science to back up their denial? Or is it yet one more instance of someone wanting to prevent something, even if it is true, from messing up the good thing they've got going? For if global warming is really happening, it really is an inconvenient truth. It's inconvenient because if it is true, we can't just go on doing what we are doing as if there are no consequences to us, to those who come after us, and to the very planet we count on to support our lives. But how like us to resist anything that calls our actions into question, that would hold us accountable, that demands something more or different from us? Surely you experience that resistance in yourself or another many times and in many ways at home or at work or at school or in your family or a circle of close friends or within the organizations of which you are a part or in your neighborhood or community or in the broader society. We don't want the truth to mess up a good thing we've got going. And yet, as we know, that good thing is not always as good as we'd like to think it is. And sometimes the truth, though hard to hear, is what we need to hear. Sometimes we need someone who can see things clearly and who cares enough to risk speaking the truth in love. For only the truth can open up the way to a truly good thing. I'm remembering times in my own life when someone cared enough to tell me what I needed to hear even if I didn't really want to hear it. And it made all the difference. For one thing, I could no longer go on pretending that there wasn't a problem or that I was do what I was doing was okay or that the course I was on would get me somewhere I really wanted to go. Think about it. What truth-telling is needed right now in your life, in your family, in our society, in our nation, maybe in our church? Who needs to hear the truth and who is able to speak it? 
speaking the truth in love. It's something we need to be able to do for one another. Telling it as it is, but doing so because we care about the well-being of the other person and are committed to the life we share together. And here's the thing. As Christians, you and I don't need to be afraid of the truth because the truth with a capital T is incarnate in the very one we worship, the Christ who speaks the truth in love to us, who is himself the way, the truth, and the life, and who loves us enough to want us to share in his way and truth and life, even here and even now. As followers of Jesus, we need to be those who speak the truth, who stand up for what is true, and who are truthful ourselves. We need to be honest and courageous, accepting and speaking words that may be difficult to say or hear. It's important for each one of us. It's important for all of us together. It may not always go well for us either. We shouldn't be so surprised by that. It certainly didn't for Amos or for John. Even Jesus himself was put to death by those who were fret threatened by the one who is himself truth. And yet he lives still. He is alive and well. Proof positive that the truth really does win out in the end. And so let us worship him and no other. Let us follow him and no other, so that we might share in his good and blessed life, even now and even forever. Amen.